Yes, my name is Dr. Erin Mabel. Um, I reside here in Manchester, I was born and brought up in Manchester in the UK, but I do class myself as a Nigerian born in Britain, because that's what I am. Uh, people used to question that, but I said, but that's what I am. You know, if I was born in China, or my parents gave birth to me in China, I'd still be a Nigerian born in China. I mean, I'm very proud of my Nigerian heritage, and I'm extremely proud of my, you know, British roots as well. Um, I'm an academic, I'm a mom, I'm a wife, and I'm also a grandmother as well now. And um, I've more or less always worked full time, but very pro women. That's me. It's whatever else you want to know. Um, educational wise, uh, I'm from a family of academics. So, and if anybody knows the Nigerian family or the African family, you know it's like read your book, read your book, read your book. Um, so yes, I have uh, two degrees. I have a degree in business and finance, and I also have a combined honours degree in psychology and advanced early years. I have a master's degree in urban education and I also have the honorary doctorate degree from Salford University as well as lots, lots of other um, professional qualifications. Professionally I'm a staff development and training officer. My professional uh, training is in training. I was trying to work out to phrase that but in training. Um, basically um, I used to work for a well-known charity, a very large charity training their senior managers and managers to be better managers in their job and training them in public speaking. So, First and foremost, I should say that I never ever set out to be an activist or a community activist. Um, I used to actually refute the title of being a community activist because I used to see activists as troublemakers. You know, and I used to think, I'm not a troublemaker. However, years on, I think that is what I do, you know, but in a nice way and in the right areas. Um, my activism, I suppose, I was thrust into it when a friend of mine was shot in front of me. He was shot 12 times and uh, I found myself uh, making the 999 call, giving first aid, you know, trying to determine whether he was still alive or dead and all those things I've just never had to do. Gun crime wasn't a part of my life. I heard about it on the TV, you read about it in the papers. And if I'm going to be honest, when I saw it on the TV and read about it in the papers, I felt and I thought, well, you know what, it happens to them or those kind of people because they're involved in it. And when it actually happened to me right at my feet, you know, it was it just changed my life. That day changed my life um, because there was a, a, a lot of people just very quickly. I'll tell you, we were in a, a house party where there was a lot of people that saw what happened uh, but when the police turned up. I mean, everybody turned deaf, dumb and blind. And that's when I realised that the wall of silence is actually real. It does exist, because the walls went up, the silence came down, nobody would speak. And we were told by our own peers um, that, well, we don't speak to the police around here. People don't speak to the police. And I was like, yeah, but you know what? My mate's just been shot and I'm speaking. And there was lots of things about that night. I mean, I made the 999 call to the police and the ambulance, but it actually took them almost 50 minutes to arrive. And we were about five minutes from the hospital. If I was able, I would have picked him up, put him in my car and got him there a lot quicker. And uh, we were told uh, from senior police officers that, well, it takes 45 minutes because, well, it is a bit of a no-go area, that part of my side. We were told by a local councillor that, well, it's true. It's a bit of a no-go area. And I mean, to tell the truth, I was absolutely flabbergasted because I'm thinking, well, hang on a minute. I live there, so does that mean if I make a 999 call, nobody's coming? I thought, no wonder the place was like how it was. And um, the fact that people were not speaking to police, that got me. The fact that we were told it's a no-go area, that got me. The fact that my children were threatened on the way to school at gunpoint, to warn their mum to stop speaking to the media and stop speaking to the police. That got me, me and my husband. The fact that people let off gunshots outside our house, you know, at night, not once, not twice, to warn us again to stop speaking to the media and stop speaking to the police. You know, that's when I thought, you know what, if somebody feels they have to do something to me, me in particular because I'm speaking the truth, then so be it. But that's not going to silence me because my mate got shot. 12 times and I am not going to see a good friend of mine get shot and I turn my back and do nothing. I thought that's why the place is the way it is because good people decide to do nothing and I see myself as a good person but I was not going to decide to do nothing. I decided that I'm going to do something about this and whoever was with me, they're with me and it worked out that there were other people that felt the same but probably just too afraid to speak up and so hence that's what thrust me into 
becoming the activist that I've become, and um, I don't regret it. To tell the truth, I don't regret it. It took a few years for me to realise what I was actually doing, um, but I don't regret any of it at all. I'm quite proud of myself with what I have managed to achieve with people around me, you know, close people around me. I'm very proud of what I should say we've achieved, which we do know about what five years ago or ten, eight years ago, it was a reduction. There was a reduction in gun crime in central Manchester by 92% because of some of the work that we were doing on the ground, being a local advocacy group and a local um, pressure group to local and central government. So we've achieved and it's good. So it's, it was also about holding people to account. You know, not only the powers that be, but also holding to account local people. Because first and foremost, what we felt we had to do, you know, especially me and my husband, because um, we were part of the same, you know, unit, was about changing the mindset of local people and actually getting local people to own the problem. Because people used to say, oh, you know, the police don't care or the government doesn't care. And it was more or less, well, why should they care when you don't care? If you don't care, then why should they care? Yes, they are going home. Other people are going home to peaceful neighbourhoods. They haven't got, you know, youngsters running around on the streets. And to tell the truth, we all knew who the youngsters were. They were our children running around, around in our streets. So we had to own the problem, and that included me. It might not necessarily have been my children, but I know them. They might be my children's friends or associates. So we all had to own the problem. And it's only when we began to own the problem and the issue did things begin to change. Because we used to say to people, we live inside the box. On the outside of the box, people can throw as much money as they like into Mossine. It's not going to change anything unless we that live there want change. And that's when things started to change, when people started to realise that, actually, what you're saying, I mean, you know, we set up our group Charisma. What they're saying is true. It's our problem. We have to change things or we have to want change. And then when you're willing to then work with the decision makers and the powers that be, we're able to then say to them, well, actually, this is how we see change being. This is what we would like to see. And that's when things started to change. Mm -hmm. It took us six years to bring gun crime to the top of the government's agenda because they were not interested, mainly because they sit down south in London and it's not happening in their neighbourhoods. And unfortunately, you know, Mossai did get the badge or the medal or the strip, you know, for gun crime. I mean, gun crime could happen in Liverpool and still Mossai got the blame. Um, and so it was about, again, also changing their mindsets and letting them know that there were some of us that were not going to allow them to demonise a whole community, you know, for the sake of what, tourism down in London. You know, you know I, I personally remember saying that to a Home Secretary that it's, it's not going to happen. You know, it's not going to happen. And it's not only Mossai that has gun crime issues. There were other cities, you know, what we were saying to the government was, in fact, it's not, they were saying to us, Mossad has an issue with gun crime, whereas I was saying to them, well, actually, no, the UK has an issue with gun crime. It's not just about Mossad. Young people were getting killed in other cities. Um, but again, I think it was about making people, or getting people to realise that they had to speak up. And it was very challenging. You know, it was very challenging. Sometimes going down to home office, and I'll be the only female, the only black female, the only person from Mossad, and, you know, you're sat in a room with about 12 or 15 white middle-class men. That is challenging because, you know, I have been told once when I was at one of those meetings that, oh, you know, you're only here as a token. And I thought to myself, you know what? And I admit, I agreed with them. I said, yeah, you know, I said, you're right. I am here as a token, you know, and you do have, a, have an agenda. But by God, have I got an agenda as well. So I remember telling them out loud, every time I went to a meeting, I said, you know what? I know I'm the only woman. I know I'm a black woman because I am a black woman. So there's no point in me saying I'm not a black woman. And guess what? I also know I'm your token. And you get all the ticks. She's a woman. Tick. She's a black woman. Tick. Gun crime. Tick. From my side. Tick. I said, yeah, that's a lot of ticks. I said, but you know what? I've got an agenda as well. And I'd laid my rules down on the table. And that's how we used to begin a conversation. I mean, you know, I used to say, let's put the cards on the table. I know I'm black, I know I'm a woman, but guess what, I've got an agenda. Mm -hmm. And it was challenging, but at the end of the day, I think when they used to always come to have conversations about Mossad and gun crime, and, you know, they'd always start by, well, look, let's tell you what it's like in Mossad. And I used to say, because I remember when the Prime Minister even came, uh, when Tony Blair, when he came down, and um, even that in itself, they wanted me to come to London for a gun summit, and I said, what's the point? What's the point in one woman coming to London for a gun summit, so let's all sit down and discuss what's going to happen in Manchester, Mossad, around gun crime. I said, I'm one person, I'm one voice. 
I said, some of your men have probably never even come to my side. Why don't they come to my side and sit down and speak with people that actually live here and hear from more than one voice? Because I just, I just said to the, uh, Tony Blair's office at the time, I'm not coming down to another, yet another meeting with about 15 white middle class men who don't even know how to spell my side, never mind about where it is. So in the end, he came. But it's even when he came, he started the meeting by saying, right, well, what we're going to do first, I'm going to tell you about all the issues of Mossad that Mossad's having. So that's when I stopped him dead in his tracks and I said, you know what, sorry, no. And he said to me, no. I said, no, we live here. We already know what the problems are living here in Mossad. So you're telling us you've got 20 minutes and you want to spend 15 of those minutes telling us what we already know. I said, we've already had a pre-meeting, which we had, because I called everybody together, I organised the meeting. And we had a pre-meeting and we then came up with recommendations, things that we were going to tell the Prime Minister. So I said to him, we already know what we're coming to tell you, how you are going to solve the gun problem that we have. So he sat back and he went, OK, over to you. I said, thank you. He said, it's your meeting. I said, yes, it is, because you asked me to chair the meeting, not for me to chair the meeting, for you to come here and you chair the meeting. I said, it's my meeting. And he was like, <laughs> but yeah. I think challenges, sometimes you just have to take them in your stride. As long as you know who you are and what you're about, you know, and know who you're representing. <clears throat> and don't take things personally. Some things you have to just take on board, you know. So when, I mean, I've had it said to me more than once, that, oh, you know, you're a token. And you know, I'm sitting there think, well, yeah, actually, I am. Because I'm the only black woman down there. So I am a token. You know, I've once said to somebody, you know, you're our token white guy. And he said, oh, yeah, I am. I said, yeah, you are, because you're the only white guy. So you're our token white guy. And the thing is, why should he take an offence? You know, if they can use those terminologies, well, why can't we use it back? But we need to understand why we're using them and how and when. Mm -hmm. 15, 20 years ago, you know, the streets of Mossad were not how they are today. You know, the, there was the gun crime issues, young people readily able to get hold of weapons and readily willing to settle their scores using a deadly weapon. Um, Lots of young people probably not believing in themselves. Um, lots of responsible adults, I would say, not believing in young people. And those responsible adults could either be parents, grandparents, school teachers, youth club, you know, whoever. Also not believing in young people, especially young people that came from a particular coast, postcode. And more so if you were a black young male, you know, it's kind of like they were already written off. So one of the things we set out to do through Charisma was actually, one of the things we like doing is changing negatives into positives. And so we decided that, well, what we'll do is use our knowledge and our experience and our life experiences to actually speak to young people and not be afraid of young people. Because I think back then there was a lot of adults that were afraid of young people. I know personally, I heard too many a time, you know, adults, especially parents say, no, I can't talk to him. I can't talk to my son. And I remember the first time and the second time, the third time I asked somebody, what do you mean you can't talk to him? How old is he? Oh, he's eight or he's 12. And I'm thinking, excuse me, that's a child. What do you mean you can't speak to your child? You know, I mean, I was expecting to hear something like, oh, he's 28 or he's 32. By then they've got their own life, you know, and they've chosen their path. But to me, when it's a youngster and you're still, even if you're still in high school, even college, you know, that's your child, even though, no matter how old a child gets, because what I say to my children, I'll still always be your senior. You know, so even when you get to 50, if I'm still alive, I'm still your senior, you know, so I still have the last say. Um, but I think one of the things we started to do was actually get parents to understand that you are the responsible adult and you are the number one role model in that child's life, no matter what it is you've done. You know, because we used to speak to some dads that say, oh, well, no, I've been in and out of prison. My child doesn't respect me. Then we say, oh, yes, they do. You're still that child's number one um, um, role model. You know, and if you've done something as an adult in your life that you don't want your children to, to do or to follow, you tell them about it. Talk to them about it. Don't hide it from them. Talk to them. Tell them why. You know, um, we used to have lots of conversations like that with um, parents. And it's not only the fathers I'm talking. You know, you've got some of the moms who said, you know, I don't know. For example, oh, you know, I, a mum might say, oh, I ended up at 40, um, 14, I was pregnant. I don't want my daughter to do that, so I don't let her out. I don't let her go. And have you ever told your daughter that you ended up at 14 and maybe have to have a termination, so therefore you don't want her to go? No, talk to her about it. And then she'll understand why you don't want her to go out and she'll stop climbing out the bedroom window, sort of thing. Um, we used to go into schools a lot and lead school assemblies, 
you know, giving messages of anti-gun and gang crime to young people as to why they shouldn't get involved in gun and gang crime. Um, I remember it was challenging for me to even get to go into the schools at first, because I said when I go into schools, I wanted to show the young people photographs of what a bullet does to the human flesh. And at first it was like, oh God, no, you can't show children that. No, they'll have nightmares. I said, well, they're supposed to have nightmares, you know, because they're supposed to know it's wrong. Because when somebody gets shot and the police go and put the tape round, nobody else sees up close and personal what has actually happened, as like I did with my friend. But a parent has to go and look at that maimed body. Family has to go and look at that. So the person, the, the perpetrator or the possible perpetrators, they should see that as well. And I also, when I was challenging the schools, I remember, you know, when, when I was at school, they used to have all this anti-stuff around them. Um, bonfire night and what fireworks could do and they used to show us all the pictures of the burns and the this you know until today personally I've, I don't think I've ever bought a firework never mind go to light one you know because of what I saw so I think I was remembering things like that that you no know, these can be kind of deterrents for young people so let's talk to them about the issues that we're afraid of them getting involved in let's talk to them about it and I used to say to the schools and um, the city council here that Talking about or not talking about gun crime was like when we were at school, I don't know about you, when I was at school, not talking about sex. You know, nobody talked about sex. Even in your household, you didn't talk about sex. And when you went to school, you could tell who was doing it and who'd done it, but nobody ever said anything. You know, sometimes some girls will be pregnant, but you still, thought, you still behaved as if, I don't know what's happening there. And I was saying to schools, that's what gun crime was like, the talk about gun crime. We didn't talk about it. We knew who'd done it, because I always said the streets talk. If somebody got shot, believe me, within a week, the streets, neighbor, you know who had done it, but nobody was talking. You know, the streets talk, children talk. When they go back to their neighborhoods, they talk. When they go back to their families, they talk. So we were saying to the schools, you know, schools were saying to us, no, school is a safe environment. So therefore, they didn't want the street talk to come into the schools. And we were saying the street talk is already in the school. It's in the playground, it's in the classroom, it's already there. You're just, you know, putting your ears, covering your ears to it. Whereas if you allow young people, or if young people know that, you know what, if I've got an issue or a problem emotionally with some, you know, about the fact that someone's been shot and I don't know what I'm feeling, we said school should be a space that they can come to and say, can I sit down and just talk about it and just get it off their chest? Because that's what we used to do with Charisma. We used to have people just coming to us, just blurt it all out, talk it all out, and it's not going anywhere. The only time we used to say to people, if they really gave us vital information that, you know, I know who shot so and it's did it, did it, we used to say to them, well, we're obliged to actually pass that information on to the police. Um, but some, most of the time, that's why people would come and tell us, because they wanted the information to be passed on, but not directly from them. And so it was about creating that space and the environment where people were able to talk about gun crime, which, again, wasn't an easy thing to do, because, yes, we were labelled as snitches, grasses, uh, informers. Um, people even said we're being paid by the police. I'm still waiting for that paycheck if we're being paid by the police. We weren't paid by the police. Because we, we decided that we will openly be seen communicating with the police. And that meant being seen with them on the streets, talking to them, going to meetings with them, calling them to meetings, hence why we set up this IAG as well independent advisor group. We said we're going to be openly seen to be doing that because really the police were not the enemy. We were our own enemy, you know. I think within peace and conflict resolution, the role of women is very important. And the thing is the women's voices are very rarely heard. And in my analogy, I feel women's voices are not heard because the, the, the conflict that we're often dealing with has got a very, very male energy. Gun crime, you know, male energy, um, terrorism, male energy, radicalization, male energy, gangs, even male energy. You know, people don't feel that there's female gangs, whereas there is. Um, there were females involved in carrying guns, you know, as well. But it's, I think, because it's a very male energy, and um, the voices of women and the actions of women are not. Um, they're not noticed, you know, uh, you know, they don't see that female energy first. And hence, that's why uh, I think females tend to feel like, you know, they either they have to really work 
three times as hard to be heard, or they give up and they walk away. Females are able to deal with conflict in a completely different way from what males do with it. Males, and it's true, ego gets in the way. The male ego gets in the way. Not to say that women don't have ego as well, because some women do have ego. But again, I think it's a different type of energy. I mean, the male ego is an energy where, you know, they feel I have to be first. I have to be the strongest because of my physique. Um, I don't cry. I don't show emotion. Whereas the female ego is probably different. You know, if a female is showing emotion um, during conflict, that's usually an emotion of anger. And that's where they then draw the strength, you know, to be able to, you know, do whatever it is they have to do. It's not always, although sometimes it can be, but it's not always you know, uh, a macho kind of ego. And so therefore I think women need to be listened to because women, the way we solve problems, we're more problem solvers uh, and we solve problems um, psychologically using our minds rather than using the physical part of us, you know. Not to say that men always do it in an um, aggressive or physical way, but, you know, we don't feel that we have to be you know, macho in solving the problem. I think really what women tend to do is you sit back, you watch, you listen, you observe, and then you go, actually, have you tried this, 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 this? And sometimes because it's such a simple resolution, the males around dismiss it because it's, you know, it appears to be too simple, but sometimes it's the simplest things that work, you know? And so I just think in today's day and time, we need to listen to women more you know, um, I am doing a bit of work around radicalization, you know, and I'm saying the same thing. We need to listen to the women. Yeah, you know, women definitely have a role to play in um, peace and conflict resolution. We probably have the more important role to play. I'm the executive director for Chrysalis Family Centre. And yes, we have predominantly our clientele is our women. And um, they are women who've probably got strong roles within their family but they have very little self-esteem because you know either through lack of money or lack of um, respect from the male counterpart their self-esteem has been you know pushed down and down and down even though they have a very important role to play within the family as in mother wife um, housekeeper you know everything else that being a mum comes with um, but because of external circumstances, and they are kept down, and some of those external circumstances sometimes can be culture that is used to keep a woman down. And especially when um, your own culture is being used on you outside of your cultural remit. So basically here in the UK, we're in another man's land, and someone's using the cultural ways um, uh, and idioms from back home, wherever back home may be, and imposing it here. That can be confusing for somebody, you know, and for women, because they're trying to do right by their culture, by their family. However, you know, exteriorly, on the exterior, you're being told some, something else. You're a woman. You're an important woman. You have a voice. You can do whatever you want to do. You don't have to listen to the man. You can run your own home. You don't need the man. They're being told all these messages, whereas on the other hand, culturally, you're being told, you're a wife, you will respect your husband, you know, you will do as you're told, you will look after your children, you will look after the household, you will respect the man of the house, you know, he is the man of the house. So it's kind of like, well, you know, how do I fit these two in? Um, and so we have a lot of women, like I say, who have issues with that. There's immigration issues as well, because we have a lot of women that come in on a... Uh, a spousal visa and that can be used as uh, a form of oppression where you know a husband will be saying to the to the wife well you know you don't have your stay in this country and if you don't obey me I will send you back and you won't go back with your children I will keep your children here. A, a huge part of our work at the moment now is actually working with parents on um, parenting because a lot of the parents, their children have ended up in care because they've smacked them. So we have a training program that we put together, which has been accredited, called Bridging the Cultural Gap in Parenting. So basically just teaching parents about the fact that we do have rules and laws around smacking. You know, we have the Children's Act 1989, which some of them is like, 
whoosh, what's that? Um, safeguarding rules and laws that we have. Um, just the whole thing around smacking and then also teaching parents how to discipline their children without being physical. That there is a way, you know, most of the parents I say to them, does your child have a phone? Yes. Did they have PlayStation? Yes. Did they have an iPad? Yes. Did I... Well, when they're being naughty, take those away, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's about just training parents and, um, and working with social services as well. We have had some successes where we have had children have been given back. We've managed to retrieve them back. But we have some where the children, five years later, they're still in care, you know, still in care. Some very sad cases. The ones that we've managed to get back, it's been a battle. That's been a challenge, a real challenge. One of our main achievements, what we enjoy, is when we get children back from social services and we reunite them with their birth families. You know, that, that's a joy. Um, we educate people. We have English, uh, English classes that happen here. Um, there's one going on downstairs. We do ESOL classes. Well, the English classes, it's when somebody has gone through the English conversational classes and then they actually get a job because we have a work club as well, and they come back and they say, you know, I'm working now, I got a job, or my children have now gone to college or, you know, university, or they come back and say, you know, if it was a, a woman that's been through domestic violence, you know, that comes back and say, says, I now have my own place, I have my own passport, I've done it, you know. Um, those are achievements for us, and a lot of our work actually comes through um, referrals from other people. You know, we find that we don't really have to do very much external advertising. And I suppose that's an achievement in itself, that people know we exist and they know what our successes are. And I think people who've been through our system, which from whichever angle, actually tell other people. So, you know, that's really good. Uh, there is a bust of myself, which actually sits permanently in Manchester Town Hall. And it's made out of 50 recycled guns. Um, it was done by a very lovely woman artist called Karen Lyons uh, who created it. The thing I think that I'm most proud of with the bust is the fact that it's um, the first female statue in 150 years to go on display in Manchester Town Hall. So I think that's an achievement and I think that's a great one for women. I always say it creates a new paradigm in history. You know it's a female statue. I'm a black woman you know, a black woman, I'm an African woman. And I think the real paradigm in history that it creates is the fact that I'm still alive. You know, this bust has been done while I'm still alive. So it's really good because I can go and interact with it, you see. Um, I have people that take pictures of it and send me pictures. People that I don't even know send me pictures on Twitter. I saw your thing today, I think it's mine. I think, oh, that's absolutely marvellous. I mean, but if I was dead, you know, I'd be up there somewhere, or well, down there, I don't know, you know. <laughs> but I think that's really, for me, that's an achievement because statues are normally done when somebody's dead. And I, I think, personally, I've always said it's better to give gratitude to people while they're still alive. And I think that's why I don't particularly like funerals because everybody stands up and talks about how well the person was, but when they were alive, you never told them. So, so even with my own father, when you know, he died at 93, and his 90th birthday, I said to my siblings, look, we're going to throw a really big party for dad. Some of them were like, ah. I said, you know what? No, let his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren come and tell, them, tell him what they think of him. Let, them, let him hear it, you know. And so we did that because I said to them, we knew he was passing away. I said, what's the point in waiting to when he's gone? And then we're going to read all these wonderful things about him. You know, it, it's, to me, it's hypocritical. You know, so I'm really glad that he's there. You know, I can interact with it, my children can interact, even my grandson, sons can interact with it. So I think that's a big achievement in itself, you know. First female statue to put on, be put on display in 150 years. Mm -hmm. And I'm black, you know, not white, I'm black. Um, I'm a deputy lieutenant for the county of Greater Manchester, which I think is another great achievement. Because um, usually people ask me, oh, what does that mean? Well, I deputise for the Lord Lieutenant. And basically what we do is we represent Her Majesty the Queen outside of London. So royal events that she would go to in Manchester, that she's not able to go to, they usually ask the Lord Lieutenant. And if he can't attend, I get asked to attend. So that's really good. Because again, I'm a black woman and I'm an African woman and I represent Her Majesty the Queen. Another new paradigm in history. You know, it's like, pardon? Yeah, that's it. So um, that's really good. I, 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 and I enjoy doing that. 
I do citizenship ceremonies where you swear people in, you know, people that become new British citizens, you know, I swear them in, which I think is great. So many people must have my photograph on their mantelpiece. <laughs> but it's, it's a really, I think it's a really honourable thing to be able to do, you know, if you want to talk about queen and country. It's the, but then it's not only about queen and country. I think it's inspiring for black women. You know, because like I say, I'm a black woman, a Nigerian woman, African woman. I think it's really inspiring for African women. You know, so I love that. I was recognised as one of the 100 inspiring women in Manchester. And I remember on that day, they said, oh, you know, you will speak. You know, we would like you to speak. So I said, yeah, OK, fine, yeah, I'll speak. But I actually thought all of us were going to speak. It was only me that spoke. Because they said, no, that I'm the top one <laughs> inspiring women out of the 100 as well. And I was like, oh, blow me, you know. And I think I'm a kind of person, I take all these things in my stride, you know. So like I said, when I went there, I thought, here's me. I was asking, so where's the other speakers? Like, oh, no, no, there's only one. There's only you. But even that's an achievement, you know, to be recognised as one of the, you know, top 100 inspiring women in Manchester. Because obviously there's lots of other women. It's not only me. But to be recognised as one of those, I mean, that's inspiring in itself for other women. And as I keep saying, black women, because I am pro-black women, you know, and African woman, Nigerian woman. I do have a lot of you know, awards and recognitions, but I think it's really, really important when you're recognised by your own, you know, because that's who you really want to recognise. And I think it's really important when we as a people, we as women, can pat, some, can pat a fellow woman on the back and say, well done you know, rather than tearing each other down. So for me to be recognised as one of the top 100 Nigerians in the UK, and that was really good for me, because I'm thinking, you know, the Nigerian embassy, not that I do what I do to impress them, but, you know, they've obviously looked around, maybe asked questions, scoped, and felt, you know what, we need to give her a pat on the back. And I think if you're recognised by your own people, that's even more important, you know, and you probably even cherish that one even more. Louise Dakikoji, she was an inspiring woman to me and a woman I did look up to. Didn't speak to her very much, but I do remember her speaking to me, if you, if you understand what I mean. Um, you know, and telling me, well done. You know, especially when we got the radio, Peace FM. I think that's when she, you know, she spoke to me on a one-to-one -one and she said, young lady, she says, well done. You know, you keep doing what you're doing. And I remember she did ask me to actually come and interview her you know, um, but this was when she was in hospital that she come and interview, but unfortunately I didn't get round, you know, to go in to do it. But also Louise Dakakodi was also the patron for Nigerian Women's Group, you know, Manchester. She was also our patron. So I did have interaction with her. I wasn't the chair at the time. Um, I was the publicity um, secretary. So I did have interactions with her through, through that. But it was more of, you know, like an ob observing, you know, because you see this woman who's a JP, she's this, she's that, you know, and you kind of sit back and you think, wow, you know, this is one powerful lady here. So let me just sit and observe and learn by observing. So whilst I said we, I did have interactions with her, but it was more as she was the patron of the Nigerian Women's Group. So we used to ask her advice on certain things and which way forward on certain things. And she used to give advice. Then I'd go off and do certain publicity things. She would talk to us as a women's group, you know, if we wanted to do something and we're saying, oh, we couldn't, she was like, well, why can't you? You know, why can't you do that? Of course you can do that. Oh, well, I'll speak to so-and-so and I'll make this phone call and then, you know, you can meet up and then go and do this. I mean, she was always, she would never accept the fact that we couldn't do something. You know, it was always, yes, you can do that, you know, and if we said we couldn't, you know, you were questioning. I think that's why most of the time I didn't speak when she was around, because if I said, I can't do that, I know she's going to ask me, well, why can't you do that? And if you didn't particularly have an answer, it was like, uh, yeah, you're right, I, I should go and try, you know. What do I see for the group and for the future? I think it's very important to let the women know, African women, that we are women of the soil. Um, you know, Mother Earth, Mother Nature, all that kind of, if you want to take it on the spiritual side. But I think, not even, I shouldn't say but, and that good old saying that, you know, if you educate a woman, you educate a whole village. And this is what I see the project trying to do through the stories of other women, inspiring other women and educating other women, that they too can go on and do marvellous things. When I talk, I do a lot of you know, after dinner talks. And when I talk to women and other young women, I tell them that, 
you know, and I say to them, I'm an ordinary girl, I'm a local girl, you know, some people sometimes will ask me questions like, oh, did you go to private school? Like, private school? No, I'm a local girl, born and brought up in my side. And if I can achieve by, you know, setting myself a goal or a dream, it's probably more a dream, so can they. And I think that's what, you know, women of the soil can do through the stories of women, what if they're past, present or future, use those stories to inspire and educate other women to get up and go on and do something. So we're not was, we're here and now and looking forward to the future.